ball and hoop demonstration. So now I'm heating up the hoop. Now as I heat up the hoop, as I become a hoop heater, okay, you guys are going to believe either that the ball is going to fit through better because the, if the hoop expands, the hole is part of the hoop and the hoop, the hole will expand, right? Or you're going to believe that the hoop is going to expand equally outward and inward, therefore making the hole smaller. How many, how many do you have that believe that the ball is going to fit through better? Raise your hand. Fit through better. How many say it's going to fit through worse? Okay, so it's clearly going to fit through better and worse. Yes? That's a conflicting theory. So let's just try it and it fits through better, much better. Yes, there we go. Yeah, so that's interesting, right? The hole gets bigger along with it, and that's kind of good, right? Because everything scales along with the object. If the object gets bigger, the hole in the object gets bigger. And here we go. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and so you can actually use this. Blacksmiths use this thing. Have you ever heard of cold riveted steel? Yes, this is something that maybe people heard more about when there were like a lot more rivets in our lives, right? But anyway, um, the idea is that you take the rivet, this is the rivet, a rivet is like a little nail that goes and joins some pieces of metal, right? You take the rivet and you cool it down and then if you can, you heat up the hole, right? And if they just barely fit together, and that's the way rivets work, is they just barely fit together. When the hole cools down, it tightens up on the rivet and the rivet expands, yeah? And then the rivet can't never come loose, yeah? Kind of a thing, right? Okay, little applause. I want a burst of applause for this. There you go. All right, now, oops, I turned off the Bunsen burner too early. Okay, now, here I have a strip of metal, and this metal is called a bimetallic strip, and that's because on this side it's got brass, this side it's got iron. Brass, iron, brass, iron. Now, bimetallic means two metals. So literally, this is a two metal strip. Now what you need to know is that brass and iron are not the same metal. Brass expands faster than iron. Brass is on the bottom side, yeah, yeah. Brass is on the bottom side, iron's on the top. Brass on the bottom, iron on the top. Brass expands faster, so when I put it in the flame, what's it gonna do? It's gonna bend which way? Brass is on the bottom. It should bend upward, yeah. Couldn't I use this to detect the temperature in this room? For every temperature, right, this thing's going to be in a certain position. So those big outdoor thermometers with a big dial on them, they've got a bimetallic strip in them that coils or uncoils. My old house used to have a bimetallic strip that turned on. A little burst of applause for that. Okay. And now, watch. Hey, Garde. Woo! <laughs> Here we go. All right. Okay. It used to have a bimetallic strip inside the thermostat, right? And when it got cold enough, honest to God, there was a little, there was a vial with a little bob of mercury in there, right? And when it got cold enough, it would tip to one side and the mercury would roll to one end. I'm pretty sure they don't put these in houses anymore, right? The mercury would roll to one end where it would connect a couple wires. Mercury is a metal, right? So it can connect, make an electrical connect, con connection and it turned the furnace on, right? Um, so anyway, there we have it, right? Um, you see these on bridges, don't you? Yes? Okay, um, not so much talking about these guys, right? But, but these, are, these things here are called expansion joints. Do you suppose those have the purpose of allowing the bridge to contract and expand? Yeah, yeah. contract and expand, right? Now, why, why, why the teeth? Why not just have a gap that is like an inch when it's like 130 degrees and like 10 inches when it's um, minus 20, yeah. Bridges oftentimes are like a quarter mile away. Yeah, 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 so it's got a lot of distance, right? Why not just, why have teeth though? Why have teeth? Why not just have a gap that just gets really big? Because the tire. Yeah, the tire's gonna go kabam bam in that thing, right? <laughs> okay, just a little gap. I don't know if you've ever driven across a place where they've not patched the road correctly, right? And left like a little gap like that. Just a little gap, like even eight inches wide, just is really painful. It's like kabam bam bam, especially if you've got those really narrow tires, right? Okay, these things here, uh, they put them on sidewalks. On sidewalks, they can look like that. They're just metal that slides like that, right? But yeah, bridges can be like a quarter mile long. And then the, the, if you don't leave room for them to expand into, they'll buckle. I mean, they're going to expand. They're, you know, this is, you can, you can um, take, one of the demonstrations they do is they, they take uh, water. You put water inside these little metal spheres and cap them real tightly and stick them in liquid nitrogen. And when the water expands, it bursts of steel. So this, this, this this expansion and contraction uh, is, is, a, is a huge thing, right? Um, 
Railroad rails. What's the predominant feeling you have when you ride the, in a railroad car? What's the, what's the sound you hear? Padum 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 padum. Besides, like rocking crazily back and forth, right? That padum 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 padum, right? Okay, that's the the steel wheels going over the little gaps in the rails. Why are there gaps between the rails? Yeah, they go they go from being twenty below, say in North Dakota, right? Twenty below or thirty below or forty below Fahrenheit in the winter to like so hot you can't touch it. That's like one hundred and forty Fahrenheit, right? Okay, amazing temperature range. They've got to leave space for them to expand into, right? What? Yeah, in the summer it's not as noisy. In the winter it's, it's, it's louder, right? Now, here's a funny thing, right? Um, think about rails on a, on a hill. As they expand and contract, aren't they going to inch their way downhill and eventually fill the gaps at the bottom of the hill? This, is, this, this happens, right? This is why railroad workers have to go and re-gap the rails or whatever, and they tighten them down and everything like that because they're always expanding and contracting, right? Um, Glassware, there's the, uh, if you buy, if you spend uh, a lot of money on, on glassware like this, this is Pyrex, right? Pyrex is actually a type of glass that doesn't expand very fast. It doesn't, it has a very low rate of expansion. And the nice thing about that is that if I've got this thing and I've got, um, I stick it over the flame, right? And then I, I, it's hot and then I, I maybe pour water into it, right? It's less likely to break. And the reason why it would break, of course, is that part of it is big and part of it's small. Right? This thing is able to bend. Metal is flexible. Yeah? Right? So if part of it's big and part of it's small, it just bends. Glass is not so flexible. So if part of it tries to be big and part of it tries to be small, it tends to shatter. Right? But Pyrex doesn't expand very much, so therefore it's not as likely to shatter. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, and then finally, finally, then, and this is, I don't know, the most gruesome thing, but I actually went, in 1983, I went to s visit my sister in Japan. Um, she was teaching English there, and I uh, went to the museum in Hiroshima about the atomic bomb. And the most amazing thing, and this is the thing that, that really got to me, I mean, you know, besides just being an American and being there, um, uh, the thing that really got to me was that they had images, and the atomic bomb went off, it was night, uh, they, they detonated it at about 2,000 feet, right? And the blast from that radiation came down, it hit the walls of the buildings, and it heated them instantly to like, like a bajillion degrees or something like that, which made them thermally expand, which made them shatter off the surface of the building. It's called exfoliation, right? And it can happen more gradually on a, on a geological scale, right? But the atomic bomb exfoliated all these stone buildings, except for where there were people standing in front of the buildings, right? These people who were, who were vaporized actually protected the building behind them, and you can see the image of them burned into the stone, right? Yeah, for me, that was the thing. It was like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. These are people, right? Um, there might be. I don't know. We could, we could try and find it. I don't have time right now, but we can, we can look for that. Um, okay, so pressure. This is one of these sort of high-pressure lessons. So, I, I think in chemistry class, you guys talked about pressure, but I bet you did not relate it to force and area. This is my guess. Okay. But here we're going to talk about force and area. So here is our formula. One of two formulas we're going to have today. Pressure is force over area. And you should be able to remember. I mean, I, I always remember the formula. Here's how I remember it. Give me any unit of pressure that you know. Atmosphere is not so good. Okay, give me another one. Pascal is not so good. How about we inflate our tires too? PSI. Yeah, pounds per square inch. PSI is pounds per square inch, yes? Okay. Pounds is force, isn't square inch area? Yes, it is. Okay. And so this is basically, that's the notion, right? Is that it's force per unit area. It's how much force, right? And this, for us, it's going to be Newtons, right? Our area is going to be square meters. And a Newton per square meter is called a Pascal, right? You can abbreviate it Pennsylvania if you want to, right? Oh, yeah, I guess Pennsylvania is like capital P, capital A, but, you know, yeah. there we go, right? Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we have it. Um, and let's hit the right arrow. Oh, we've got to demonstrate this, right? So a pound per square inch a pound per square inch is a pound of force, and we can feel a pound of force. A pound is the weight of a pint of water, yes? Okay, that is eight pints, therefore it's eight pounds 
of water. The gallon is, right? 